Muy buenas tardes. Muy buenas tardes. En nombre del Instituto Tecnológico de Santo Domingo, el INTEC, y la compañía EPSA LAPCO, ingenieros consultores, le damos la más cordial bienvenida a esta actividad que da inicio a una alianza que viene a enriquecer las acciones de carácter educativo y científico orientadas a promover el continuo mejoramiento de la calidad de vida de nuestra sociedad y el desarrollo sostenido del país. Las Cátedras de Excelencia, que hoy iniciamos con la conferencia Ingeniería de Pavimentos. Agradecemos la presencia del rector del INTEG, el doctor Rolando Guzmán, del presidente de EPSA, LAPCO, el doctor Manuel Gómez Achécar, el doctor Franco Gómez Ramírez, director técnico de EPSA, LAPCO, y el ingeniero Arturo del Villar, decano del área de ingenierías del INTEC. También saludamos la presencia de las autoridades académicas, miembros de nuestro consejo académico y miembros de la Junta de Regente del INTEC, las autoridades administrativas y en especial a cada uno y cada una de ustedes. Y un agradecimiento especial al doctor Marshall Thompson, quien va a ser el orador invitado en la noche de hoy. Esta importante actividad se está transmitiendo vía streaming a nuestra sala de videoconferencia en el cuarto piso de este edificio, García de la Concha, y también a través del canal de YouTube del INTEC. Y van a quedar grabadas todas las incidencias para posterior consulta y difusión que ya le iremos dar a conocer a través de nuestras redes sociales. Hoy celebramos el encuentro de dos instituciones que comparten objetivos comunes. De un lado el INTEC, una entidad privada sin fines de lucro, de finalidad pública creada para contribuir a la transformación social del país, a la promoción continua de la calidad de vida de sus habitantes y a la preservación de su patrimonio moral y material para legarlo mejorado a las generaciones venideras mediante la educación superior, el desarrollo de la cultura, la investigación y la divulgación científica y tecnológica. Cortésmente invito al doctor Rolando Guzmán, rector del Instituto Tecnológico de Santo Domingo, a ofrecer unas palabras. Señor Manuel Gómez Achecar, presidente de EPSA LAPCO. Señor Marshall Thompson, profesor emérito de la Universidad de Illinois en Urbana Champaign, señores directivos de EPSA LAPCO, señores directivos del INTEC, señoras y señores. Como muchos de ustedes conocen, desde el momento de su fundación, el Instituto Tecnológico de Santo Domingo, INTEC, ha procurado ser un actor relevante en el proceso de desarrollo de la sociedad dominicana y en el crecimiento y expansión de sus capacidades productivas. En correspondencia con esa intención, nuestro plan estratégico institucional actualmente vigente, que en este momento de hecho alcanza su quinto año de implementación, estableció como una directriz esencial el fortalecimiento de los vínculos de la universidad con los sectores empresariales, viendo en esto o fijando la atención en la aspiración de convertirnos en el aliado académico natural de tales sectores. La actividad a la que en estos momentos damos inauguración se enmarca justamente en esa intención, pues representa un claro ejemplo de trabajo colaborativo entre el INTEP y EPSALACPO, una empresa privada de prestigio que ha visto en nuestra universidad el escenario ideal para la discusión rigurosa de temas de relevancia en el ámbito de las ingenierías. Acogemos, por tanto, con muchísimo entusiasmo la oportunidad de servir como sede a este ciclo de charlas magistrales 
a través del cual la comunidad profesional dominicana tendrá acceso a exposiciones de alto nivel por parte de expertos de renombre internacional. En la actividad de hoy, particularmente, tendremos la ocasión de nutrirnos con las experiencias, con las largas, los largos años de experiencia del doctor Marshall Thompson, profesor emérito del Departamento de Ingeniería Civil de la Universidad de Illinois en Urbana-Champaign, que como muchos también conocen, es considerado como una de las facultades líderes a nivel mundial. La ocasión es propicia, por tanto, para destacar otras formas de colaboración entre el INTEC y esa entidad, la Universidad de Illinois, con la cual desarrollamos actualmente el programa denominado 3 más 2, mediante el cual nuestros estudiantes tienen la oportunidad de cursar tres años de estudios en nuestro país y dos años de estudios en Illinois para conseguir así un título de maestría emitido por cada una de esas entidades. Ese programa que empieza a desarrollarse de forma muy exitosa es parte de una amplia variedad de programas conjuntos con instituciones extranjeras de primer orden entre las cuales se encuentran los programas de licenciatura con Penn State University, con la Universidad de Miami, con Western Michigan University, para citar apenas unas cuantas. Por tanto, para finalizar estas palabras introductorias, quisiera expresar un agradecimiento a aquellas personas especialmente involucradas en el desarrollo de esta actividad. En primer lugar, por supuesto, mis agradecimientos para el, presidente, para el presidente de EPSA LAPCO, el doctor Manuel Gómez Achecar, quien fue quien concibió la idea primigenia que dio paso a la organización de este ciclo de conferencias magistrales. Gracias a eso, EPSA LAPCO da muestra de ser parte de un grupo distinguido de empresas que considera la educación como una de las formas más nobles de ejercer su responsabilidad social empresarial. En segundo lugar, dirijo unas palabras de reconocimiento al señor decano de Ingenierías del INTEC, el ingeniero Arturo del Villar, al director técnico de EPSA LAPCO, el doctor Franco Gómez, y a través de ellos a sus equipos de trabajo que acogieron con gran entusiasmo la idea hasta llevarla al punto en que nos encontramos en esta tarde. En adición, gracias de todo corazón a nuestro conferencista invitado, el doctor Marshall Thompson, por la gentileza de visitarnos. Es realmente, doctor Thompson, una gran distinción recibir su visita, que entiendo es la primera, pero que estoy seguro no será la última que usted realiza al INTEC. Y finalmente, damas y caballeros, Gracias a cada uno de ustedes por aceptar nuestra invitación conjunta y acompañar al INTEC y a EPSA LATCO en este momento, que estoy seguro va a constituir un momento memorable para cada uno de ustedes. Muchísimas gracias y feliz resto de la noche. Gracias. Muchas gracias a nuestro rector, el doctor Rolando Guzmán, por sus palabras. Por el otro lado, la empresa EPSA LAPCO, también una entidad privada que provee servicios de ingenierías, adquisiciones y gerencia de construcción y tiene como objetivo potencializar la máxima calidad de servicios para contribuir al avance tecnológico con estándares éticos fomentando el uso de nuevas tecnologías y procesos, así como la promoción de la enseñanza, la investigación y la innovación. Invito al doctor Manuel Gómez Achecar, presidente de EPSA LAPCO, quien también tiene unas palabras para nosotros. Señor rector de INTEC, doctor Orlando Guzmán, 
distinguidos miembros de la Junta de Regentes, Consejo Académico, profesores, ingenieros, colegas, invitados y alumnos de esta magnífica universidad. Estimado profesor Thompson, hace un poco más de 30 años, el ingeniero José Ordeix Cabral, que en paz descanse y quien suscribe, nos reunimos para formar una sociedad que llamamos EPSALAPCO, tomando los nombres de cada una de las empresas pertenecientes a cada uno. La primera, creada en el año de 1984, a pocos meses, quien le habla, de regresar de la Universidad de Illinois en Urbana Champaign para proporcionar esta empresa nuestra estudios, proyectos y supervisión de obras. Y la segunda, creada en 1960 para realizar trabajos de laboratorio de suelos, roca, concreto y asfalto. Al momento, EPSALAPCO, Ingenieros Consultores S.A., está conformada como empresa EPCM, es decir, equipada con los recursos y organización necesarios para proporcionar servicios de ingeniería, adquisiciones y gerencia de construcción, así como supervisión a todo cliente que tenga planes de iniciar proyectos de infraestructuras, ya sean públicos o privados. Durante estos últimos 30 años, hemos tenido muchas satisfacciones y desafíos que nos han permitido crecer como empresa. Agradecemos a todos nuestros clientes, tanto privados como públicos, pero específicamente me place en mencionar al Grupo Punta Cana por habernos permitido trabajar durante estos 30 años y por 24 años de manera ininterrumpida. A Barrick Pueblo Viejo, por servicios realizados desde su instalación en Pueblo Viejo desde el año 2008, a la actual administración del Ministerio de Obras Públicas y Comunicaciones, MOPC, por los servicios que nos han permitido prestar desde su inicio. A estos agradezco la transparencia y la confianza siempre presentes igual al resto de nuestros clientes. También hemos sido afortunados de tener colaboradores que han crecido técnicamente junto a nosotros y nos dejan predecir un excelente futuro para todos, puesto que se han formado con los valores del buen carácter y de la actual tecnología. Hemos querido hacer una celebración que aporte socialmente al país. Y qué mejor que a través de compartir experiencias de la mano de expertos mundialmente reconocidos sobre temas de gerencia, supervisión y buenas prácticas en el sector de la construcción. Entendemos que como empresa y como parte de nuestra responsabilidad social empresarial, debemos contribuir a la innovación y educación continua. Recientemente notamos en el tope superior de un lateral del edificio que alberga la biblioteca principal de Boston, una frase que decía aproximadamente lo siguiente, la educación de la gente es salvaguarda del orden y la libertad. Agradecemos pues a INTEC, en la persona del señor rector, doctor Rolando Guzmán, habernos permitido realizar este acuerdo de colaboración, el cual, el cual entendemos es un aporte social al país. Y en esta ocasión, el fruto de lo enseñado para la Universidad de Illinois, por la Universidad de Illinois en Urbana Champaign, a través de su máximo exponente en ingeniería de pavimentos flexibles y semirrígidos, el doctor Marshall Thompson. Muchas gracias.
Doctor Manuel Gómez Achecar, presidente de EPSA LAPCO. Muchísimas gracias por sus palabras. Queremos recordar que durante la presentación del profesor Marshall, por favor pongan los celulares en silencio o en vibración para mantener la concentración. INTEC y EPSA LAPCO hoy concretizan el objetivo común de fortalecer las competencias de los estudiantes y profesionales de las áreas de las ingenierías y lo hacen a través de las Cátedras de Excelencia, un programa de charlas y conferencia en torno a temas de gerencia, supervisión y buenas prácticas en el sector construcción, dictadas por expertos internacionales y que están dirigidas a estudiantes y profesionales de estas áreas. Esta iniciativa, como explicó el doctor Gómez, forma parte del programa de actividades del 30 aniversario de EPSA LAPCO bajo un acuerdo interinstitucional firmado con el INTEC. Esta primera cátedra de excelencia trata el tema Ingeniería de Pavimentos. Invito al ingeniero Arturo del Villar, decano del área de Ingenierías del INTEC, a presentar el charlista invitado para esta primera cátedra de excelencia. Muy buenas noches a todos y todas. Para mí es un verdadero placer introducir al doctor Marshall Thompson a través de esta pequeña reseña muy pero muy comprimida del largo y fabuloso trabajo del doctor Thompson. El doctor Thompson recibió su Ph.D. en la Universidad de Illinois en el 1964. Formó parte del personal a tiempo completo en el 1962 como investigador asociado asumió el rango de profesor asistente en 1964 y fue ascendido a profesor en el 1970. Se retira como profesor en mayo de 1996, pero sigue estando profesionalmente activo en investigación y consultoría. El doctor Thompson ha ocupado varios cargos en la Universidad de Illinois en investigación y enseñanza. Tiene experiencia de campo con la División de Carreteras y Contratista de Illinois y ha acumulado extensa experiencia en consultoría en pavimentación de aeropuertos, carreteras, suelos, materiales y ferrocarriles. Sus principales campos de interés son el análisis, diseño y construcción de pavimentos flexibles, materiales de pavimentación, subrasantes, estabilización suelo material y rehabilitación de pavimentos de hormigón, también como, conocido como rubulization. Fue director del Programa Cooperativo de Investigación de Carreteras y Transporte de la Universidad de Illinois desde 1987 hasta el 1997. Se ha desempeñado como supervisor de proyectos desde 1962. Estos proyectos han sido patrocinados por la Fuerza Aérea de los Estados Unidos, el Illinois Department of Transportation, the United States Department of Transportation, el Ejército de los Estados Unidos, TRB National, eh, programa Cooperativo de Investigación de Carreteras y varios grupos industriales, entre otros. Ha publicado más de 205 artículos de revistas técnicas, boletines e informes de investigación, Sociedad Americana de Ingenieros Civiles, Sociedad Americana de Pruebas y Materiales, Junta de Investigación de Transporte, TRB, etc. El doctor Thompson desarrolló los procedimientos de diseño de pavimentos flexibles flexibles por el método mecánico empírico Food Debt, HMA y pavimentos flexibles convencionales, que son utilizados por el Departamento de Transporte de Illinois desde 1989. Las actividades principales recientes son la ca caracterización y el diseño de rehabilitación de los pavimentos de hormigón Rubalized PCC con recubrimientos de hormigón asfáltico y el diseño de pavimento perpetuo de hormigón asfáltico. El doctor Thompson fue nombrado el hombre del año de la IL Asphalt Paving Association en 1995. Recibió el premio Ronald D. Canyon de Investigación y Educación de la NAPA, Asociación Nacional de Asfalto, en el 1997. Recibió el distinguido premio de la investigación de la AFTRE, Fundación de Agregados para Tecnología, Investigación y Educación, Asociación Nacional de Materiales Férreos, 
Asociación Nacional de Agregados en el 1998. En el 2000 recibió el premio KB Woods de la Junta de Investigación de Transporte para, por el excelente trabajo técnico, diseño de sobrecapa asfáltica pa, para pavimentos de Robolized PCC en el campo de diseño y construcción de instalaciones de transporte. Fue elegido al Salón de la Fama de la Asociación Nacional de Pavimento Asfáltico en, en, el, mil, en el 2005 y en el 2012 el doctor Thompson recibió el premio del servicio, al servicio distinguido del Instituto de Asfalto. Señoras y señores, demos la bienvenida con un fuerte aplauso al doctor Marshall Thompson. Thank you for those kind introductory remarks. It's a privilege to be with you folks. I've been here before working with Manuel and some of the folks here on several projects. I always look forward to the opportunity to visit the DR. That's my uh, nickname for the Dominican Republic, by the way. I, I uh, picked that up. But anyway, it is a, an honor to be here, particularly appreciate Manuel's generosity and uh, Franco and the Epsilabco company and the opportunity of meeting some of the Intech people. Uh, we're looking forward to the uh, opportunity of working with some of your students. We've had great success with Dominican students. Manuel Franco and the young lady there, Clarabel Alvarez, she's one of my sweethearts. And uh, anyway, we've had great luck with uh, those folks over the years and we look forward to having many more of them with us. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity of sharing with you. I've been doing this kind of uh, work with highway pavements and airport pavements, et cetera, since oh, the late 1950s. As an undergraduate, I specialized in highway engineering, and then my PhD work was in the area of uh, pavements and materials primarily. So thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'll try to uh, share with you some of the things that I've learned uh, sometimes the experience that it took to teach me those things wasn't the most satisfactory, but I f find that the, you learn from sometimes the failures you have, but luckily I've had mostly successes, so I hope to maintain that record in the future. It's always nice to have young people to help out us older people. I'm going to be 79 on Saturday, so uh, I need all the help I can get. So. But uh, the topic uh, I'm wanting to consider today is flexible pavement engineering, some important considerations. I want to emphasize these are not all of the considerations, but they're the ones that I think are most important. And so uh, we'll move ahead with that. A uh, few introductory remarks about the uh, relationships I've had with Manuel and Franco. Manuel, he finished up in 1984 with his PhD, and the title of his thesis, the Mechanistic Design Concepts for Full Depth Asphalt Concrete Pavement. The data that Manuel developed and analyzed and we worked with is still at the very heart of the Illinois DOT Full Depth Asphalt Pavement Design Procedure. We've tweaked it a little bit, Manuel, but it's still basically the, <laughs> including the work that you did, and we appreciate that. And then in 2002, uh, I finished up with the uh, father-son dog and pony show, so to speak. Uh, Franco shows up. I remember Franco at age 10 uh, when they left in 1984, and uh, so Franco and I go back a long way also. But uh, Franco's thesis was on characterizing aircraft multiple wheel load interaction for airport flexible pavement design. How do we get that name, Franco? How that title? That's kind of lengthy. <laughs> uh, we were fortunate in uh, 
that time period to have been named as the Center of Excellence for Airport Pavement Research by the Federal Aviation Administration. And Franco was part of that uh, project. Uh, he spent one summer at uh, Tech Center at Atlantic City and picked up some very good experience there, helped us out, and uh, his thesis was a major contribution, and uh, we appreciate that. Just a few uh, introductory overview uh, remarks here. Basically, a pavement has to sustain wheel loading, and uh, so these wheel loadings can vary from you know, very light ones up to very large ones. A lot of the aircraft these days have 65,000 pound wheel loads at 250 PSI tire pressure. And uh, we keep thinking maybe they will top out at some value. Uh, <laughs> they keep going. In my career, they ratcheted up considerably. I remember flying in a DC-3 uh, doing University of Illinois extension work. And for those of you who uh, I've never been in a DC-3, you have not missed one thing. It's not a good ride, okay? But uh, basically, we have to devise a pavement structure that will accommodate wheel loadings of various sizes and magnitudes and huge numbers or a few numbers. We have a lot of pavements throughout the world where we have very small wheel loads and very large wheel loads, and it goes from a little bit of traffic to a huge amount of traffic. So that's the major thrust we need to work with. From the standpoint of deciding how thick the various layers of that pavement need to be doing, we look at the loads that are applied and such things as the strain at the bottom of that asphalt concrete layer, stresses and strains in the stabilized layer, what's going on in the granular base materials, and also in particular, what is transpiring with our subgrades? Subgrades are very important. I want to now move into some considerations of these various issues that I mentioned. We've got subgrade soils, materials, traffic loading, pavement analysis and design, structural evaluation, construction and climate. Those entries in the yellow are the ones I'm going to primarily be emphasizing. So it's not that the rest of them aren't important, but these are ones that I consider very important. Subgrade soils. There's an old adage in highway and pavements engineering, and it goes something like this. You cannot bury a bad subgrade. It will eventually come back to haunt you and present major issues and problems. We've got, if you have subgrade problems that you do not address properly, you build your pavement, if the subgrade is inadequate and not properly prepared and properly considered, how do you get back to it? You don't. So it's a major issue when you have subgrade problems in your design process. We picked up on this former colleague of mine, one of my former PhDs, Barry Dempsey. We had a presentation at the first international conference on concrete pavement design in 1977. And the title of that was Subgrade Soils, an Important Factor in Concrete Pavement Design. Now, I'm not a concrete pavement guy, so don't pass the word on that I'm down here preaching concrete, okay? It's okay. I've got a lot of friends in the <laughs> concrete industry. But uh, in this particular case, we were fortunate to have this opportunity to look at subgrades. You have to have a working platform that's adequate to support construction. If you do not have a good subgrade support, you cannot build a high type quality pavement. That's something that I've learned on my career, others have learned long before my career started, but we must have a good working platform to construct high quality pavement. Also, the subgrades have an important impact on the design and the performance of the pavement section from the standpoint of strength, modulus, and permanent deformation, rutting characteristic. Okay. The first major issue we have to address is what is out there. 
Subgrade soils are quite variable. We have to characterize the nature of those subgrades in some detail or else we may miss out on some weak spots, etc. Soils don't just happen. Soils are formed as the result of the interaction of these so-called five soil forming factors. We won't get into a lot of detail, but this is not a simple situation. Parent material, bedrock, alluvium, uh, etc. Time, is it an old soil or a young soil? Climate, hot, humid, cold, etc. Topography, is it flat? If you've ever been to Illinois, and Manuel and Franco at Espagia can <laughs> testify to this, it's flat. It's like a pool table in Illinois in many cases. It's absolutely flat. You can see for miles and miles. And then we get vegetation. We get prairie grass, right? We get all kinds of trees. We get situations where we do not have vegetation. All of those factors interact to form a soil profile which starts at the top with A horizon, we get B horizon, C horizon in most cases. So if we understand soil forming factors, we can learn a lot about those soils and how they might behave in a uh, pavement operation. There are, uh, there's a worldwide technology called soil taxonomy. How do you name soils, et cetera? And uh, the United States Department of Agriculture has been very active in this. And they spend a lot of time and effort and money in mapping soils, studying soils, physical properties and chemical properties, drainage properties. And they publish this information. It's readily available. In many of the cases, we have soil surveys that show up out on the website. Note the web soil survey. And uh, I was talking to Franco, I gather that this type of information is not readily available here. I would urge your Aggie soil guys to interact with you folks and, and get involved and, and promote this type of thing. It's very helpful. I've seen times I can engineer a project better from my desk with a soil map than I can by drilling holes out there on the right of way. So this just shows you a clip from a chunk of highway in the southern Illinois, Clark County, Illinois. It's a three mile section. And within that section, you can see those yellow areas. Those are different soil types. There are 15 different soil series or types in that particular chunk. And as you can see, the predominant soils are a soil called Drummer. We get Camden. We've got Sinatra wine, Brooklyn, and those soils all have some unique features and characteristics. So it's important to recognize soils don't just happen. They're there for a reason. We understand a reason. We can then better handle those soils in pavement analysis and design, as well as in agricultural related situations. Subgrade stability. Years ago, I remember we had some situations. We had folks at the Illinois DOT said, oh, well, you know, we just build them, and as long as they're not uh, too wet while we pave over the top. Well, we were getting rutting, we were getting uneven construction, we were getting low quality construction. And so we started a project called Subgrade Stability. This is what you would call an unstable subgrade situation here. As you can see, uh, this is over southeastern Illinois, a place called Grayville Route 1. And that certainly is what you might call uh, a lack of stable subgrade. This is another opportunity to look at a bad subgrade. That's a Verdkin stabilization machine stuck in a, quote, unstable grade. They're going to build a pavement there, folks. Sooner or later, they're going to build a pavement. Our problem is how do we make it suitable to build a pavement? When we look at stability requirements, we have to look at rutting i.e. the rut depths that form under construction traffic, the need to be able to support compaction operations so we get good densities in the material layers. The properties of interest are the strength of the soil. We have a test called the CBR, California Varying Ratio. The particular test was not invented in California, but it's called CBR anyway. 
and unconfined strength, we got modulus E values, modulus of elasticity, and the rutting resistance. That's a good illustration of a pavement uh, subgrade where we've got some extensive rutting occurring. Okay, if you plot subgrade strength versus the sinkage of a typical uh, truck that might be operated on a project, if you have a subgrade strength, CBR, of around six, probably you're not going to have a rut depth after several passes of a loaded truck greater than about a half an inch. So that's a good ballparky number to work with. We need to be able to compact those materials. Vibratory roller. This is what we call a growth curve, showing the development of density as a function of number of passes of the rolling equipment. Notice we go up to a certain level and we peak out, level off, and uh, so more compaction does not produce increased density. Uh, this is a shot of a pavement section in Oslo, Norway. Some of you may have heard of the Norwegian quick clay, and they go unstable. You start working with them, they liquefy, actually. And so we were using some lime here in this particular case, trying to, dish to solve this particular problem. Notice that in this project, they started compacting the asphalt concrete layers before they tried any stabilization. Those tears and cracks in the surface of the asphalt are due to the fact that as the roller goes by, you get very high tensile stresses on the top of the pavement, so it actually tears the pavement apart. Obviously, that is not a layer of material that's going to perform properly. So here's an operation where we're paving on a good grade. How do you evaluate the uh, characteristics of the subgrade from the standpoint of uh, its strength and its relationship to density and, uh, and moisture content. We've developed a procedure years ago, ago called the uh, IDOT procedure, Utilization White Procedure, where we basically compact the mold of material, standard moisture density test, and then we penetrate it with a CBR piston. And in reality, that gives you a number practically the same as a quote standard moisture density, or excuse me, a CBR test that you would run on an individual mold. So we find that that allows us to characterize the soils. Notice here, typical moisture density plot and the CBR. CBR is dropping off, as you can see, the optimum moisture content there is around 20%. The wet side, you start losing strength. On the dry side, you increase strength. If you look at other soils, though, like the so-called Fayette Sea, this soil is a material that is characterized by very low clay content, maybe 12, 15 percent clay, and uh, practically everything is through the minus 200 C, so it's a silt-sized material with a dab of clay. Notice how quickly that moisture uh, CBR relationship drops off on the wet side of optimum. So if you're on the wet side, you're going to have an inadequate subgrade. This shows the Fayette C and the Drummer B soil. As you can see, that Drummer B is a soil that has a fairly high clay content, probably 40%, less than 2 micron clay. And it is not as moisture sensitive as Fayette C, which has very little clay and mostly silt. What's the subgrade strength? How do you measure strength? We need a quick way of doing that, and there are several procedures. The old Corps of Engineer cone penetrometer, you uh, operate that through pushing that cone into the soil, reading the dial, and you get an indication of the uh, cone pressure. And if you divide the cone pressure, which is the cone index, by 40, that's basically an estimate of this California bearing ratio. This is a shot of Quentin Rob a former student of mine, but wound up at Georgia Tech, where Quint's pushing that rascal into subgrade. It, it tops out at a CBR of about six or seven. However, if it's stronger than that, you don't have a problem, so you really don't get concerned about, you know, the stuff that's stronger than what you need. So it meets the requirement and then some. This is an automated dynamic, or excuse me, a DCP on the left is a handheld version. 
The DCP is widely used throughout the world. I picked up on this in Oslo, Norway back in the, in the early uh, 70s, brought it back to the States and we've been using it. We actually built several of these in our shop and distributed them in the highway departments. And finally there were some uh, entrepreneur types that started manufacturing them for a profit. I don't, it wasn't Manuel, by the way, but it was. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, those are readily uh, available now. And you can get an automated version of this. There are several of those around. The thing about automation is it can go wrong. If I, all you have to do is lift a weight and drop it on a, an anvil and measure how much the cone penetrates. You can't get much simpler than that. And it seems to always work. That's where you want strong grad students to be on your project, right? <laughs> We, uh, I remember one time, I think we had three or four crews of DCP guys on a flexible pavement job, and uh, by the end of the day, we were a little on the tired side. How do you address these issues, these remedial procedures, for wet subgrades and unstable subgrades? You can do moisture density control. Remember, if we control the density and the moisture, we can get to a situation where we have a stable grade, namely on the dry side. We can undercut, i.e. remove the bad subgrade and backfill with aggregate material, or we could do admixture stabilization where we treat the material in situ, in place, using various uh, techniques. On moisture density control, if you look at moisture <coughs> content for a CBR6 versus optimum, plot that against the PI of the soil of plasticity index, you can see there's quite a scatter there for the various compaction efforts, standard proctor, modified proctor, and standard proctor over two. I think this simply says moisture control criteria alone don't always work. The criteria will vary from soil to soil. Now, if you are able to characterize the soil properly, then you could set that perhaps or uh, let's say you're using a borrow pit and the soils are fairly homogeneous, you could set a moisture uh, content control in terms of percent of optimum for a situation like that. Moisture density control, though we have problems, drying efforts, how much work, how much effort, how much equipment do you want to provide to consider that issue? Drying days, hey, you don't control the weather, at least we don't. We've had a lot of hot days lately. But uh, drying days are something that uh, we have no control over the temperature, the evapotranspiration, i.e. the ability of moisture to evaporate from the surface of the soil, and uh, temperatures, etc. So we can't control that. And how many days of drying do you have? You may have a wet month and have very few days where you have good drying conditions. Moisture control is a temporary solution. It's a passing solution. You've got it today, you get some wet weather and you now have an unstable condition, you're back to what we would consider baseline zero. We can undercut and backfill with granular material and the amount of cover, i.e. granular material, stabilized materials, et cetera, you need over the subgrade, need to be of such thickness that the subgrade stresses, as shown here, are less than the ones the uh, soil can sustain. Okay, so that thickness required is associated with an allowable subgrade stress. We've developed, whoop, that didn't show up so well, uh, this particular plot where we've got the uh, CBR uh, on the axis, the horizontal axis, the thickness requirements on the left. And uh, in reality, at, at CBR 6, you really don't need to have a treated grade or a granular material. But as you move down at CBR 4, you need about 12 inches. And at times, we have done as much as 24 inches of stabilization in order to improve the grade. We looked at some of these uh, requirements from that particular chart, looking at wheel loads, typical wheel load for current 20,000-pound uh, single wheel loads in the States, at least 115 PSI tire pressure. And we were estimating the subgrade modulus, the ERI term shown here, and the unconfined strength of that material is about 4.5 times the CBR. So we looked at this for a particular uh, granular material situation to see what was going on in the subgrade. 
as you can see here, the dot corresponds to the thickness of the granular material and the SSR value is subgrade stress ratio, that's a subgrade stress divided by the unconfined strength. As you can see, by increasing that thickness requirement, why the subgrade uh, stresses will go down and the stress ratio will go down. As you move through those very low subgrade CBR values, notice we're talking about some 20 inches of material, either improved granular material or a stabilized layer, something of that sort. And this shows how that particular chart produces fairly uniform requirements in terms of the surface deflection of the subgrade. If you've got surface deflection, uh, you know, in that ballpark less than 50, probably you're going to have a stable grade. Admixture stabilization. I cut my teeth on lime stabilization. My thesis was entitled Lime Stabilization of Illinois Soils. And uh, lime stabilization is widely used throughout the world, throughout the country, and uh, it's an excellent material. Cement is widely used and type C fly ash is used in some cases. But uh, lime and cement probably are the predominant products that are used. You can see here the various uh, operations uh, of construction, spreading the admixture here. We got a water truck and a bird can stabilizer, grading and compacting, and you're able to produce a treated layer that has very significantly improved strength and modulus properties. So it will provide you that working platform you're looking for. Resilient moduli of the soil are uh, inputs that we need for practical mechanistic pavement design. And uh, we did several projects back in the 70s, 60s and the 70s on this and developed some techniques and procedures. This is what we mean by resilient modulus. This is a load or a stress pulse produced by a moving wheel load. We have a situation where the deviator stress increases as that increases. The deformation, <coughs> uh, excuse me, the strain goes up and then we unload it and it comes back. Well, the resilient strain here is the one that we use for calculating E sub R, the resilient module. It's a deviator stress divided by a recoverable strain. And there are large values there. Fine grain soils soften, higher stresses, lower moduli. As you can see here, around six PSI or so, we kind of flatten out and we do not have large decreases in the modulus at those higher stress states. But we certainly wouldn't want to be in a situation where <coughs> we have uh, very, very high stresses. The soil uh, that we work with in Illinois, and this is fairly representative, I think, of a lot of materials, where we look at the unconfined strength of CBR and the E sub RI, that's a KSI, 1,000 PSI. Notice we get stiff, medium, soft, and very soft. Early on, uh, well, I had three categories. I had stiff, medium, and soft. I got a few Shelby tube samples in from a colleague of mine at the Illinois DOT. And uh, after testing those, I decided we've got some stuff that is even more uh, of a challenge than a soft condition. So that's where we get this uh, QU of 6 PSI, a CBR of 1, and a modulus of 1. Now, that's, that's about as bad as it gets. You can't, hard, you can't walk on that material of that sort. So we got problems there. That modulus value is very important in the behavior of a pavement. In this case, I'm showing data for a 10 inch uh, <coughs> full depth section with a uh, modulus of the hot mix asphalt of around 500 KSI. And the fatigue algorithm is one that we're currently using in the state of Illinois. And you'll notice here that the subgrade, or excuse me, the HMA strain in micro strain varies from 92 up to 117. Same pavement, different subgrade. Notice the predicted fatigue life. The amount of load reps we can sustain before cracking, it varies from 11.9 to 6 or 5.1. So, you know, it's important that we get a reasonable input for the subgrade. 
in terms of pavement design. Uh, here we have a plot of the stress level versus resilient modulus for a soil at two levels of moisture content. We've got optimum on the top at minus four tenths of a percent and then we get optimum plus 1.8 percent on the bottom. Notice a very, very large difference. So the moisture content is very important. If you plot the degree of saturation for the soil, what percentage of the voids are filled with water versus modulus, you can find this uh, uh, relationship. Uh, let's back up here. Yeah. There we go. Okay, as you can see then, for 95% compaction, we've got a set of data, and we've also got a set of data for 100% compaction. And we get some T99 there, uh, in, this is standard proctor compaction. So the wetter the soil, the lower the modulus. The various models we have are the so-called semi-log model where we're plotting E sub Ri as a function of an intercept plus a, a slope term as shown here. So once again, the increase in deviator stress causes a decrease in the modulus. This is another model that's been proposed. Uh, it's used uh, in the AASHTO ME pavement design guide, which is the current rage in the states. I don't uh, particularly think it's that great, but it's used anyway. They didn't ask me to vote, so I passed up. Uh, but uh, old, old professors have the option of taking positions like that, you know, and you can't get fired if you're retired. And <laughs> right? Is that right, Dean? Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, this model includes theta, which is uh, common to sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3, and deviator stress term and a constant K1. Uh, this is a model that's used in the AASHTO MEPDG pavement design guide. Once again, it's, it's got a stress state theta and also tau octahedral instead of a deviator stress term. But all of those can be used to develop, you know, uh, models that predict modulus as a function of stress state. How do you develop these inputs? You can do lab testing. You can do falling weight deflectometer testing. We'll look at one of those shortly. And back calculate, we can do estimates based on strength, uh, unconfined strength, CBR, DCP, dynamic cone penetrometer, cone index, et cetera. You can use soil properties, clay content, PI, et cetera. Typical values like a standard unified classification or an AASHTO classification, A4, A6, et cetera. Or you can use pedology, the soil mapping techniques. Those soils have similar properties. They have similar strength and modulus properties. Subgrade variability is huge. How about a coefficient of variation of 50%? I would say that's significant. So the back calculated moduli values that we use are going to show that kind of variability, and we need to be willing to accept that and account for that. So lab testing variability is also uh, an issue. We find that our back calculated values do not necessarily agree with our back calculated values. This shows some typical default uh, values that we use uh, for these various subgrades, stiff, medium, soft, and very soft. And those are incorporated into our pavement design procedures in the state of Illinois. Uh, there are some good summary reports available. This one's by Andre Pupala down at the University of Texas at uh, uh, Arlington. And uh, ways of estimating the stiffness. Uh, this is some work that I think is very well done. It dates back quite a bit. But you can predict the modulus the resilient modulus, the repeated load modulus, as a function of a static stress strain curve for a soil, as shown here. This is another similar study that was done by uh, the so Richard Kim <coughs> at North Carolina State, one of his grad students at the Virginia Council of uh, Transportation uh, Research there. And notice here they are also predicting the resilient modulus 
as a function of an unconfined compressive strength test. And uh, in this case, it's a triax test, not un unconfined. Okay. There are other publications that provide inputs as to how to estimate modulus values. There are a huge number of values out there. So the bottom line is, what is the subgrade modulus? The bottom line is there ain't no such thing. It, there are a lot of them. You need to account for the variability and you need to account for the behavioral characteristics. The subgrade softening conditions of fine grained soils must be considered if you want theory to match up uh, with your design and performer. That, that's my position. It's not being done except in Illinois right now, but that's okay. We're, we're making progress. We'll convince those other folks sooner or later. They better be sooner because later may not be that far away from me. So, <laughs> subgrade rutting. How do we re account for the rutting of the, uh, the subgrades? The criteria that has been used for many, many years is subgrade vertical strain, i.e. you calculate the strain on top of the subgrade, and that tells you how many load repetitions you may encounter before you reach a certain rut level. Subgrade stress ratio has been around for a while. The South Africans have used that. We've been using it for years, and it works quite well. However, for subgrade strain, this shows the amount of plastic strain, i.e. the rutting, as a function of the resilient strain, which is the criteria that has been proposed for you, for three different conditions of the Fricksburg buttshot clay. That particular soil is probably the most famous soil in the entire world. It's a standby at Vicksburg, Mississippi, the Waterways Experiment Station used to be that. It's uh, carrying a different title now, but they have access to this. One time uh, we did a railroad project at Pueblo, Colorado. We needed a soft subgrade. Fortunately, we had a railroad involved. We hauled several train car loads of Vicksburg buckshot clay to Colorado to develop a soft grade for a railroad uh, track experiment. I thought that was uh, beyond the call of duty to do that. Fortunately, the railroads did it for free, so we didn't have to worry about the transportation. But this certainly would show that for a particular resilient strain, the amount of plastic strain or rutting you're going to develop is going to be different. So how can you use that for a criteria? It, it has been used, so nevertheless, that uh, <coughs> type of a criteria can be translated. Here we've got a permissible strain as a function of the number of load reps in. That RD term is in inches, that's the permissible rut depth. Notice those L and M terms bounce around the L's, the uh, <coughs> constant value changes considerably more than the, uh, the slope. This is a uh, interesting development from the Transportation Research Laboratory, the TRL group in the United Kingdom. Uh, they used to do a lot of work in trying to characterize subgrade setting criteria. Finally though, Mike Nunn and those folks, they looked at a lot of their performance data and some of their analysis, and they settled out on the idea that they're not going to be concerned about that. Say, so therefore, it's proposed to drop the subgrade strain criteria, rely on a single criteria, limits the flexural stress or strain at the underside of the base layer to a permissible level to achieve the required pavement life. And so they have various subgrade classes here, and those are the, quote, the equivalent elastic moduli value that that calculate. Notice it goes from 7.3 up to 58. So you're going to find a lot down here in this class one, class two range. And uh, so in order to achieve those types of uh, values, you may have to build a working platform, i.e. granular materials, subgrade treatment, et cetera. Current subgrade criteria from FAA, these have changed a lot in the last few years, but they're still based on subgrade strain and uh, for a large number of load reps, you get down to a point where the, uh, the subgrade stresses associated with those strains would be very, very low. Subgrade stress ratio is a technique that we've developed and like Franco and I worked at that uh, based on some of the work at the tech center at FAA. This shows uh, some work with some of the uh, FAA subgrade soils at the tech center at Atlantic City. 
This is a stress ratio. Here we've got permanent deformation, permanent strain of the functional load graph. Notice that subgrade stress ratio 0 0.25, 0 0.3, or 0 0.5, 0 0.6. Look what happens when you get the one. Okay. So in general, if you keep those stress ratios low, you will get good performance. Okay. Here we go again. In this case, we got more information, and as you would expect, uh, as the stress ratio increases the rutting potential, in this case, the permanent strain after a thousand load repetitions would change. These are subgrade soils from the tech center uh, that the FAA has in Atlantic City. Frank will spit a summary out there one time. Thanks. How do you calculate cumulative damage? We've got a bunch of different properties of soil materials. We have a lot of different wheel loads. How do we pull that all together? It's not an easy situation. In reality, probably we can just handle it this way. Franco and I put this together several years ago for a paper, and uh, you can see if you keep the subgrade stress ratios about 0.5 or 6, you're not going to have a subgrade rutting problem. They get higher, you're going to inc incur rutting, and you may get into some uh, situations where you get unacceptable levels of rutting. This is a uh, project where the uh, Waterways Experiment Station, the Corps of Engineers developed a new procedure. For uh, designing flexible pavements, and I looked at this from the standpoint of converting all of their information to a subgrade stress ratio. And the subgrade stress ratio is equal to <coughs> the vertical stress divided by the unconfined strength, and their beta term is associated with the subgrade stress and a CBR term. And as you can see, the number of coverages, how many wheel loads we can accommodate as a function of SSR, which we calculated. So there's a consistent relationship here. So it tends to confirm this subgrade stress ratio concept. If you have high volume pavements, a lot of wheel loads, probably you're going to have a pavement section that's significant enough that you will not have a rutting problem. However, you still have to have a working platform. Flexible pavement design, the actual road test was in operation in the late 50s. I was fortunate I was on that project a time or two. But at that time, they were looking at the problem of how to analyze the data. The SN concept is the structural number concept. And as I understand, you folks use the 93 guide. And so you're using structural numbers. However, they found that the deflections were equally as related to performance as a structural number. The deflection is a mechanistic response term. And so uh, they opted to go with structural numbers, not deflection. However, deflection would also work. This is how we approach the idea of mechanistic design. Notice the inputs. The structural model, in this case at Illinois, we use a thing called ILIPAVE, which Manuel used on his thesis, Franco used on his thesis with some modifications. And uh, we calculate stresses, strains, and deflections. We have transfer functions. We predict performance, i.e. rutting and cracking. And we factor in some reliability concepts to get a final design. This is our standard modulus, fine grain soils or stress softening as we've shown before. The Asphalt Institute suggests for their elastic layered program, not illy paved stress dependent analysis, that you use a modulus associated with repeated stress of about six PSI, which is ERI in the procedures that we've been using. Granular materials, though, they sh get stiffer as stress states go up. Typically, you get something like K theta to the K2 this is a simple model, but it does seem to capture the effects. This is a summary of a large amount of data that Rod and Witzak pulled together many years ago. But if you've got a two-factor model, if you get a point that plots out here from your repeated load testing, you say, I think I've got a problem, right? If you're over here somewhere, you're in better shape. 
and you can calculate k as a function of n. So uh, this n term, you know, reflects the stress sensitivity. This is a model uh, included in the AASHTO ME design guide, the latest version called AASHTO ME, and it's got a theta term and a stress term. All of these have been used. A lot of folks have looked at this situation. Here are some particular references. This is one that uh, was developed as part of the LTP, long-term pavement performance program. Notice here it's particularly associated with the 93 guide. The 93 guide included resilient modulus as the characterization factor for subgrade soils. Uh, in this case, they're predicting the modulus of a layer of granular material, a subbase or a subbase, as a function of the underlying layer. In other words, if you've got a subgrade with a modulus of 8 KSI 8000, you'd come up and say, oh, well, it's about, I'm going to have a modulus here or something more than 10, and et cetera, moving on up. However, this, this does not work. This is the work we did years ago. In reality, the stresses in the granular layer is controlled by how much asphalt you have and how thick, the, uh, how thick it is and the stiffness. Is it a high modulus or a low modulus? And as you can see, for this particular situation, as the asphalt thickness goes up, the modulus goes down. For a given thickness, say five inches, if the modulus of the asphalt goes up, it gets stiffer and the modulus goes down. But the major factor is the thickness. So uh, this has to be, I think, factored in. We get some funny numbers showing up in uh, pavement analysis based on back calculations, for example. And if you plot this previous relationship, here we got log of ET cubed and then granular base modulus. You can see that it fits together quite well. So this is a handy procedure for practical purposes. The modulus of the hot mix asphalt is important. How stiff is that material? Asphalt is, shows the modulus, it's a function of the uh, temperature and the rate of loading in particular. We need to take that into account. There have been a lot of work done in that arena. One of the models that I like particularly is the Hirsch model. This is one, MRT, that be me, okay? Uh, it's based on a, 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 basically the input based on the uh, testing of the asphalt cement. And uh, Ray Boniquist and Don Christensen at uh, Advanced Asphalt Technology, they say, look, we can estimate the modulus closer than most people can measure it in the lab based on sophisticated testing. So that's good enough for me. This is uh, another good reference on the dynamic modulus of asphalt concrete. Uh, I'm assuming this presentation will be available sometime so folks can pick up on these references. This is an excellent reference, by the way. Structural models. In other words, we have these inputs, layer thicknesses, moduli values, or stress-dependent characteristics. How do we handle those? Well, a lot of the early work, and in fact, it, a lot of work right now is still based on the idea that all those layers are elastic. In other words, the moduli values are consistent throughout. Well, as we have pointed out, that's not necessarily the case, but it's a, a simpler procedure. Here we've got mechanistic empirical design guide. We've got various finite element procedures, axis symmetric, this is illy paved, stress dependent modulus, failure criteria. We can use super precision. Franco did that uh, very well in the work we did at FAA. And uh, this particular model, one like it, was available in an early version of the mechanistic empirical design guide, but they dropped it. They didn't calibrate. And then we've got 3D finite element model. That's probably a bit too sophisticated now for a practical purposes. And neural networks, a lot of neural network. Have you ever heard a story about artificial intelligence? Someone said, hey, let's just use the real thing. And I thought, that's a good model. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, our, I'm not against neural networks, by the way. It's a powerful tool. We need some additional features that are not incorporated in most models. We assume that the directional characteristics are the same in those materials, not necessarily the case, but that's the way we assume. And 
we have residual stress effects that can develop, particularly in granular materials. Transfer functions are critical for subgrade rutting. We talked about vertical strain and subgrade stress ratio. Both of those have uh, been used. The subgrade stress ratio, I think, is a vastly superior uh, procedure. And if we get subgrade rutting problems, it's probably going to be for a low type pavement as opposed to a uh, high type pavement. So if we got a lot of easels, probably subgrade rutting is not going to be a problem. The working platform is still essential. Granular materials, they rut under repeated loading as well. And this is a recent report by uh, Errol Tudemler. It's in Chirp Synthesis 445, and it's an excellent summary of the uh, characteristics of granular materials for pavement design. I'd recommend that for, for reading. There are a lot of different models that have been developed for predicting rutting or permanent strain. Notice in this case, we've got a simple-minded model of a log model permanent strain is A plus B log N, semi-log permanent strain A into the B. Then we've got one, uh, the Ulitz model shown here. Ulitz is a uh, fellow from Denmark, been kicking around doing a lot of things. Notice he also, in this case, he has a <coughs> permanent strain as a, a stress related to stress uh, situation as well as the uh, number of load repetition. This is a model that shows up in the uh, ASHTO Mechanistic Empirical Pavement Design Guide and it basically revolves around the recoverable strain concept and uh, it looks something like this permanent strain is a function of the vertical strain you calculate on these parameters show up. But notice here, there's no stress state term that shows up, okay, in this particular uh, presentation, the way that's currently handled in the ASHTO guide. And so I think that's a failure. There's a lot of uh, work that's going on in terms of trying to be more sophisticated here. We're calculating a stress ratio based on the shear strength properties of the material. And uh, so if you've got a low stress ratio, you wind up with a uh, low rutting potential. This slide isn't showing up very well. So the uh, notice here we've got, <coughs> this is permanent strain versus number of load rep, but all of these show the same general uh, characteristics and uh, the these terms these power terms uh, ter seem to be you know in a fairly small range but the stress state is very important okay strength parameters are important for granular materials to my way of thinking we need to include them in any kind of a permanent deformation or rutting model we got complicating factors sometimes with repeated loading, the strength of granular materials increase, and it depends on how you put the load reps on. Here we've got a situation where we've got the max dry density and optimum moisture content, that's a shear strength response, strain versus deviator stress. This is on the wet side. However, if you put a number of loads on, this is that same material after a large number of loads, notice the significant increase in strength. So that's something that, that occurs and complicates this issue of predicting running. Also, the stress history. In this case, we put low stresses on, number of load reps and back and forth, and then we go to a high stress state. Notice here we're what, 3 tenths, uh, 0.25 or something. However, if you put the heavy loads on first, you pop out here and all those smaller load levels, smaller stress states, do not produce additional rutting to speak of. So that's why a lot of railroads, when they do ballast maintenance, they'll go slow orders for a while, build up a stress history, and then they go to full loading, and they minimize the amount of rutting that occurs. So cumulative damage predictions are difficult. The ASHTO uh, procedures, they came out with an advisory about granular materials indicating that uh, things aren't working very well. 
ASHTO encourages each licensing agent to sell, calibrate, and validate using local materials. That says you're on your own, okay? Now, there is a project currently underway at Texas A&M by Bob Litton. It'll be finished up uh, next summer entitled Proposed Enhancements to Pavement ME Design, Improved Consideration of the Influence of Subgrade and Unbound Layers on Pavement Performance. So stay tuned in. Maybe we'll find that out. But uh, I've seen some of the early results and I'm still not impressed. How do that con uh, the idea of rutting of hot mix? Once again, this is a rather complicated expression, but it's primarily <coughs> based on the uh, resilient strain that's calculated. In other words, high strain and you get increased rutting. This is the national model that was developed for the ASHTO design. Notice the standard error is 0 0.107. The standard error divided by the standard devi error, uh, deviation of all the values point it basically says the horizontal line may be the as good as anything. This was not a good calibration. So we're still working on that. Uh, there was a study that was conducted kind of following up to see which rutting model might work best. Uh, there were the original MEPDG, that plot I just showed you. Verstraten is a Belgian guy, worked primarily based on deviator stress. The Rita Leahy's work with Matt Witzak at University of Maryland was based on a stress and a strain. And West Track is a big operation down at uh, Reno, Nevada many, many years ago. And they worked with some sophisticated testing procedures based on shear strain and stress. They found that, uh, you know, when they looked at a bunch of different sections, different projects, that the R squared values were all kind of in, you know, the low side. Notice the standard error divided with standard deviation is still very high. The standard error of those predictions, you know, was a tenth of an inch or so. Well, that's significant, right? What is a reasonable prediction? They say if you calibrate things properly, you get better predictions. Well, how often can we calibrate? Hot mix asphalt is changing constantly. So we don't necessarily have the same material. So something we built 15 years ago may not be representative of what we're gonna to build tomorrow. And that's the problem. Where uh, the asphalt's in the ground somewhere in the face of the earth, right? So we're not quite sure where. So that brings in a lot of uh, uh, variability. Reasonable prediction. A lot of the criteria we're talking about, interstate highways, we want ruts less than four tenths of an inch. What's that, uh, 10 millimeters, something like that? For primaries, a half inch or more, uh, you get up to other uh, <coughs> low volume roads, you can tolerate more rutting. The rutting, on my estimation, is best considered by material selection, aggregates, asphalt, mixture design, construction, we can build rut resistant mixes. I defy anyone to predict rut depth within plus or minus a tenth of an inch over a 50 year period accurately. You know, it, it can't be done. So let's just do a good job of mix design. And uh, periodically we can mill off the asphalt, a little ruddy, overlay it again, you get a brand new pavement, looks good. Fatigue. This is an important input for pavement design from a mechanistic standpoint. This is a standard procedure that's used. Notice a four point bending test. This is a shot of a device in our lab at Illinois. If you plot the mix stiffness or modulus as a function of load rep, you'll find that you get to the point, you get some loss of modulus and then it kind of levels off. Sometimes it goes down like this. In this case, notice this goes out to what? Something like 40,000 load repetitions. This basically represents a fatigue endurance limit. You can apply an infinite number of load reps and not cause failure. In this case, we would define failure typically as a modulus loss of 50%. So if you're starting at 7,000, somewhere around 3,500 
uh, MPA would constitute failure. How do we look at the data? Well, we typically plot the tensile strain versus the number of load repetitions to failure. You can extrapolate that. Typically, uh, we, we use uh, this plot. This simply shows the effect of K1 and K2. K1 basically identifies the, the, uh, the intercept. K2 is the slope term. So you get this slope term increasing. You almost get to the point it goes flat. It says a very small change in strain will cause either a large increase or conversely a small uh, a decrease in the predicted life. Uh, some of the more sophisticated models, this is the ASHTO MEPDG model. Notice they've got a one over modulus term here. This does have an effect of softer mixes tend to show a longer fatigue life, but it, it's secondary to the strain term. And they've got calibration uh, factors that they've developed for the sections they worked with in the MEPG, the Mechanistic Empirical Payment Design Guide. Once again, this is their final calibration on that model. And as you can see, the standard error over the of estimate divided by the standard deviation of that is 0.815. You can see this is not a good, it just simply says if you, you know, down through here, it, we're doing fine, and then all of a sudden we've got all kinds of variability showing up. So uh, this was not a good calibration. So you have to kind of adjust things with a, uh, I call them a Hershey's constant. Actually, they're fudge factors, okay? They're beta terms. In other words, I'll play games with these betas until the predictions match up with what I observe in the field. I'm not much of a, a fan for beta terms. But this is a summary of some work that Sam Carpenter and our staff did several years ago where he looked at 84 different mixes. This was a very extensive study. The minimum K2, remember that's the, uh, the power term, was 3.5. The 90% value was 4, so 90% of all the values were greater than 4. The average K2 was 4.5. We have a very conservative model in Illinois that we're using. It's not one I recommended, but uh, nevertheless, it, uh, <coughs> is, uh, it works. This shows the relationship between K1 and K2. Notice this all falls together. If you're only using strain, versus life at a K1, K2 relationship, you know, it, it all falls together. Once again, you can tell if you got a weird mix by where it plots on this particular chart. However, the downside, the bad news, there is no unique fatigue algorithm. It varies. It's all over the place. It's everywhere. So, you know, in many cases, it's a policy call supposedly based on informed engineers, right? Sometimes it's based on policy call, based on folks that don't understand the problem very well. Okay, fatigue endurance limit. A repeated strain level below which cumulative fatigue damage will not occur. So you build a pavement section, enough asphalt, so that we never get fatigue failure of any significant amount. If we get a little ruddy, we mill it, inlay it with asphalt, you got a brand new pavement the next morning, in and out. People like that idea of being able to go in with a very quick fix and get a permanent solution that lasts a long while. The idea of the endurance limit, this showed up a long time ago, 1972, Carl Monosmith and his folks, they said 70 micro strain. That's a very low number, it's one that's used though. This is some more of Sam's work. I showed this one earlier. Notice here we're out there about 35 million load reps and we're still not getting any damage. That's obviously, in this case, a uh, quote, fatigue endurance limit strain level. The endurance limit is something that's been confirmed. We know it exists. It's not the same for all mixes as shown here, okay? In fact, Sam's work at Illinois, we had the, 
mixes where the fatigue endurance limit varied from 90 micro strain to 300. Now that's a significant bump, isn't it? 90 to 100 to 300? And the average is 125. We currently are using 70 in Illinois, so we're getting some pretty hefty design. Hot mix contractors are my friends. Okay, so if we have a fatigue endurance limit, we then have a strain level versus number of load reps to failure shown here. Here's the part where we're above the strain limit and uh, K1 over strain to K2. However, once we get here, it just goes forever. So that could be 70 micro strain, 120. In general, a change of 10 micro strain on the fatigue endurance limit in Illinois, that'll translate to one inch of hot mix asphalt. That's a lot of money. It's a significant determination. So we tend to be conservative. Okay, the fatigue endurance limit, what is it? Uh, it varies. K1 and K2, same thing. It's not the same for all mixes. Some instant recent research in this area. Uh, this is a report came out many years ago confirming, yeah, we do have a fatigue endurance limit. This particular uh, report by Ray Boniquist uh, at Advanced Asphalt Technology in Pennsylvania, they had a plan for looking at the fatigue endurance limit. They developed the plan, didn't even get the research. The research went to Arizona State, uh, Mike, uh, Matt Witsack and Mike Mamluk, and that's the INSURP Report 62. Notice the bottom line, the fatigue endurance limit is not constant for a given mix. For a given mix, that is, okay? It varies with the modulus. It's smaller for higher modulus, stiffer mixes. Rest periods are helpful. If you get a rest period between load repetitions of uh, something more than two and a half seconds, it tends to heal. And so that would change the fatigue endurance limit. This current project is one that is going to be completed. And I think this is going to be a very uh, significant study relating asphalt binder fatigue properties, asphalt mixture. So they're working with trying to characterize the binder itself and taking that behavior and applying it to predicting the behavior of the mix. I hope that's successful. In Illinois, we use uh, perpetual pavements and fatigue endurance limits. We base it on uh, the hottest month of the year, which is July. Uh, the modulus there is in the ballpark of something like 500,000 PSI, 500 KSI. However, you know, we still are considering this fatigue endurance limit. We're using 70. It should be higher than that, no doubt about it. It should be higher than that. And like I say, 10 micro strain, one inch hot mix. Summary and conclusion, the mix design has been getting better our, quote, performance predictions are not consistently satisfactory. I didn't say they were wrong, did I? I have a lot of colleagues that are making those predictions. I'm saying they're not consistently satisfactory. That's what you call a weasel word phrase or something like that. Okay, we always find calibration allows us to improve that. We need to capitalize on the attributes of finite element models. Uh, Manuel, Franco, Chuck Schwartz at Merrill and I, we say, hey, you got to do finite elements, you got to get stress dependency, you got to failure criteria. Until such time as we do that, we're going to be struggling. We need to refine our characterization models, improve transfer functions and rutting, fatigue, fatigue endurance limit. Those are really biggie there. Those are highly significant. Lots of money involved in those decisions. <laughs> cumulative damage models, stress history effects, reasonable expectation, and my bottom line, we're getting better, so uh, let's keep up the good work and we'll improve things in the future. Okay, how do we evaluate pavement structures? Project level, Binkelman beam, that goes back a long way, okay? A Binkelman beam, if you get a number of X for a Binkelman beam, a falling weight deflectometer is about 60% of that, so there's a difference between, quote, a static test such as this, and a moving wheel load test or a FWD test. That is an early version of a falling Dyna test falling weight deflectometer. Uh, Manuel was telling me last night that he uh, saw an earlier version of this one at uh, O'Hare years ago. But this is what translated ultimately to 
uh, an improved version. This is the Epsilon Labco uh, <coughs> load plate, dyno plate, they call it, and it maxes out a 22 kip load, a 24 inch diameter plate. This is a good chunk of machinery. You can characterize the quality of the support for your pavement section, the subgrade, and the layers of paving materials as you come up. Here's their latest Dyna test. Now, I would say that's a significant improvement over that earlier slide we saw of an FWD. We've developed a technique years ago at Illinois where we were looking at the deflection base. If you load this pavement, you get a max deflection. This is 12 inch, 24, 36. Other spacings have been used. But the area under the pavement profile is this value here. This value is not dependent as much on the subgrade support. It's primarily a function of the asphalt concrete uh, thickness and modulus. So it's a very powerful tool, one that we've used very successfully. Uh, we do system-wide data uh, for, you know, miles and miles of pavement for inventory purposes. The only thing you can really measure is deflection. Now, we've got falling weight deflectometer. You can't stop traffic out there on the Dan Ryan Expressway in Chicago for a very long period of time, or, or locally here. I, I tried to cross the street in front of the Sheraton yesterday morning. It took me a half hour to get, get a spot. <laughs> so we don't want to stop those folks too often. Uh, the thing called a travel speed deflectometer, a uh, recent development, a rolling wheel deflectometer. Uh, and I'll show some slides on this, but this particular procedure, I think uh, they've been doing some new techniques for measuring uh, the deflections under moving wheel loads, and it's proven to be very successful. This is a particular report that I would recommend for you. It's a, a pavement structural evaluation at the network level. Uh, there was a webinar at TRB just uh, this past month. Moving deflection devices, if you don't want to stop traffic, you want to operate at traffic speeds, 40, 50 mile an hour, we could use this travel speed deflectometer or the rolling wheel deflectometer. That's the travel speed deflectometer. <coughs> they have uh, uh, Doppl uh, laser Doppler uh, devices that measure the deflection of that wheel under moving wheel load conditions. They, they basically are calculating slopes based on these uh, measurements, and they start here and move out to this area. Well, the thing that happens is <coughs> sometimes out here they wind up with some real funny numbers, okay? Some folks are saying, we'd all start out here knowing this is zero and move back this way and, and see how that works. But they use a term called SCI, Service Curvature Index, it's the deflection at 12 inches minus the deflection, excuse me, deflection at the max deflection under wheel load minus deflection at 12 inches. That SCI term then is used uh, <coughs> in uh, predicting strains in the asphalt. This is their SCI term. You get funny numbers with trying to predict AUPP from some of their data for the TSD. So, uh, D not D12 are probably the more accurate terms. So we did a little study based on our database and found that the, the strain term, the HMA strain at the bottom of the asphalt could be predicted very well from the AUPP algorithm. If you calculate AUPP from the so surface curvature index, basically it's four times that value. So that allows you to use the uh, TSD data, even though you can't accurately calculate the AUPP term. Full depth asphalt, there's a relationship between the uh, AUPP, that deflection parameter uh, basin term, and uh, the strain in the asphalt. If you use uh, <coughs> the Illinois DOT algorithm for fatigue as shown here, you can plug in that value for the strain and you'll find that the log of the load reps is 10.44 minus 358 times the log of the AUPP. So you can run down the road and get an estimate based on that if you feel comfortable with your fatigue algorithm, which is a challenge. 
Here we have a, a rolling wheel deflectometer. Kurt Beckerbauer is one of my former students, by the way. He runs the transportation section at ARA, Applied Research Associates, and they've been using this RWD for many years. And basically, it <coughs> is using a, a technique where they uh, take pictures, you know, they high speed pictures, of, and then they move ahead and you get another, so you have a picture of the deflected section and the undeflected section, and by comparing those, they're able to uh, establish a deflection basin. They, they have lights, you know, so this is a highly uh, sophisticated scheme, but uh, it seems to be working. Here they're showing their uh, calibration. I want to wind up with some uh, things from Federal Highway Administration, uh, some transportation performance uh, management uh, concepts. Everybody is now concerned about how long will it last and when do I have to maintain it the next time, okay? Those are major issues and concerns. If you're budgeting with limited funding or no funding or lots of funding, you still need to know something about what are the maintenance requirements for the system in the future so that I can do a good job of planning. This uh, has really picked up a lot of uh, momentum at federal highways in the state, and they came up what they call a final rule, which means, hey, this is the way it's going to happen. States, buck, you know, let's uh, do a good job and get this stuff done and provide the numbers to me as I request. That's what that final rule means. Okay, here are the metrics they're using for <coughs> various combinations, good, fair, and poor, IRI. A meter per kilometer is about 63 inches per mile for translation purposes. So good is less than 95. Cracking, that's alligator cracking of the hot mix. Rutting is less than two tenths of an inch. What's that, five millimeters? And a faulting, that's for the concrete guys. And you can see it moves up to, for the poor section as much as 170 inches, that's a lot of roughness. You don't, you know, you always tighten your seat belt up on that one. The idea of a good pavement, it meets all the criteria, okay? The idea of a poor pavement, it does not meet two of the three. All the rest of them are, you know, in between. If you have a pavement in good condition, based on uh, the Fed's uh, current uh, perspective, no major investment is needed. If you have a poor condition, major construction reinvestment is needed. So, you know, general guidelines that the, they're wanting to keep uh, track of at the national level in terms of programming, funding, and things of that sort. And the interstate conditions and the non-interstate conditions will vary. The feds are also moving ahead with the idea of uh, pavement performance measures and forecasting. That means try and predict what's happening for the next several years. And we can decide when maintenance is needed, reconstruction is needed, et cetera, okay? They came up with these terms, remaining functional period. Okay, that's a neat term, huh? An RFP, shortest time period measured in years from the time of the last data collection to the time when a functional condition reaches its corresponding threshold value. And the functional conditions are primarily IRI terms. Now the remaining structural period, likewise, shortest time period measured in years from the time of the last data collection to the time when a structural distress reaches its corresponding threshold value. And that's primarily uh, rutting and the uh, alligator cracking, the fatigue cracking term. So they've got remaining functional IRI and rut depth, structural periods based on cracking and rut depth. Some of the threshold values they're suggesting in this particular report, they're also acknowledging these may change at various agencies. 172 inches per mile, rut depths a half inch, alligator cracking at 20%, longitudinal cracking, that's for concrete pavement, 
transverse tracking once again <coughs> is uh, for concrete. So these are some guidelines that they're suggesting that the states use for looking at their system and reporting their condition. System-wide RSP data, the only thing you can do out there is to get an idea of the structural uh, characteristic is something like FWD, TSD, or RWD. Once again, that's out for a high type pavement like an interstate. They're trying to predict how much life is left in a hot mix asphalt layer after so many reps. Uh, ARA applied research, so Harold Von Quintus uh, is doing this study. He's been around a long while. Their preliminary findings were not promising. Basically, they say, look, fatigue failure is based on a reduction in modulus. We don't get much traffic in the center line of the pavement, right? We get a lot of traffic in the wheel path. So you compare those two numbers and you can get an idea of, quote, damage. Or you can estimate what the original modulus was based on some procedure that you used or are using now. And uh, from that, you can compare that modulus to your back calculated modulus and rolling wheel deflectometer, travel speed deflectometer. And you can get this so-called <laughs> damage index. E field is what you measure. E initial is what you had at the time of construction originally. And the damage index is one minus that. So uh, a damage <coughs> index of zero means you dam or excuse me, uh, uh, a ratio of the moduli values of zero gives you a lot of damage index of one. And this works. They've, they've tried this a time or two. And you can see here the uh, damage index and the amount of fatigue cracking. Same thing here. This is a Georgia DOT study. They uh, are finding that uh, this particular concept does not work very well based on several test sections they looked at from the long-term pavement performance uh, program. Okay, this is my parting shot, okay? Uh, based on what I've been through the last uh, many years in trying to work in this area, I've decided that this is an appropriate way of looking at the problem. It's called Thompson's Principle. You do not want to measure with a micrometer, mark with a grease pencil, and cut with an ax. It simply says, look at the problem for what it is. More sophistication will not necessarily give you a better answer. So uh, we need to decide, you know, where are we at? We grease pencils, say we're probably grease pencils right now, but we sure in the world aren't uh, with a micrometer. Micrometers are in the future. So, hey, I appreciate the opportunity of sharing with you. Once again, it's always a pleasure to visit with you here in the DR and a lot of good friends here, and I hope to make some more. So uh, thank you very much. Muchas gracias al doctor Marshall Thompson por esta brillante exposición que nos ha brindado en la tarde de hoy. Invito a acompañar al profesor Thompson, invito al doctor Rolando Guzmán, rector del INTEC, al doctor Manuel Gómez Acheca, presidente de LAPSO, LAPSA LAPCO, al doctor Franco Gómez Ramírez, director técnico también de EPSA LAPCO, y al ingeniero Arturo del Villar, decano del área de ingenierías del INTEC. Ellos van a estar esperando las preguntas, los comentarios que ustedes tengan en esta sala. Si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, puede por favor levantar la mano. Disponemos de micrófonos en ambos lados y los edecanes van a estar ayudando, entregando los micrófonos. Recuerden por favor ser breve ser claros y concisos porque estamos haciendo una traducción simultánea para facilitar la interacción con el doctor Marshall. Así que, por favor, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, levante la mano, algún comentario, y le vamos a ayudar con los micrófonos. Es preciso que esperen el micrófono para que el traductor pueda escuchar. Pueden hacer las preguntas tanto en español como en inglés. 
¿Alguien con alguna pregunta? Los ingenieros e ingenieras de esta, de esta sala. Sí, yo tengo una, una pregunta acerca de… Eh, en, en Illinois, yo sé que hay cambios de, de clima constantes. Eh, Aquí a veces en, eh, tenemos, en vez de eso, cambios de, del tipo de soil en las carreteras. Entonces, ¿cómo diseñamos nosotros o cuál es el, la, la manera más eficiente de cuando estamos diseñando el pavement de la carretera, eh, cuando la deflexión y el, que el K1 y el K2 y todo me está variando? De, oh, oye. Oh, Ok, you got it. Ok, eh, en Illinois yo sé que ustedes eh, tienen, eh, el, el, el clima cambia, la temperatura cambia mucho. Con, eh, aquí la, la, el clima, la temperatura se mantiene casi el, el año es constante. Pero tenemos eh, el, el terreno, el soil, a veces cuando estamos diseñando las carreteras, eh, que va cambiando de cada ciertas millas eh, y tenemos la deflexión y el, el K1 y el K2 y todo está cambiando a medida que vamos avanzando. ¿Cuál es la manera más eficiente de diseñar una carretera eh, de que tenga estas características? I think that uh, one of the more effective procedures is uh, the idea of uh, stabilized subgrades will take out a lot of that variability. Uh, for example, <coughs> all of the high tight pavements in Illinois Uh, primary system interstate, we start with a minimum of 12 inches of the improved grade. Typically, it's lime kiln dust stabilization. It could be in urban areas, they sometimes use uh, crushed old concrete pavement for that thickness to develop a more uniform support for the pavement. And, and I, I, th I don't uh, think, uh, you know, there are many options around where you can iron that type of variability out. And it sort of gets back to the <coughs> uh, techniques the uh, TRL people are using, the classes of subject, and, you know, the, the dynaplate thing. And so I, I think uh, the idea of providing additional attention to uh, subgrade stability issues is a good way of going. I, I would never build a high-type table without a treated grade of some sort, yeah. ¿Alguien con alguna pregunta? Los que estamos acá en la sala, por favor, un micrófono acá. La puede hacer en español, recuerden, o en inglés, porque estamos haciendo la traducción simultánea. Hay otra pregunta ahorita por acá, para el micrófono. Cuando tenemos eh, una subrasante de CBR muy bajo, ¿cuál es su opinión sobre el uso de geotextiles para el mejoramiento de la subrasante y posterior eh, colocación del pavimento sobre esta. I think geotextiles have proven to be a, uh, a technique that, that works. Uh, it, <coughs> well, what we found on geotextiles, it's effective on preventing rutting. So if you know, you might be able to reduce uh, the thickness of those values I showed in that chart, CBR versus thickness of cover. And I know most of the geotextile folks provide recommendations. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, we, we, we find that, you know, it, it helps on uh, rutting, uh, you know, uh, alleviation for reducing less rutting. But a lot of times the FWD data on top of those sections doesn't show that much of an improvement. In other words, it primarily is, uh, I think, helpful on uh, reducing rutting, maybe thinning up those requirements on thickness. You know, uh, there's a lot of literature, there are a lot of research out there for geotextiles. I'm not against geotextiles, but I'm not a fan either. I'd prefer to do, uh, you know, 
24 inches of lime kiln dust stabilization, something like that. No, not necessarily 24 inches, but <laughs> it's a, uh, uh, a, a side comment. Uh, as I understand it, you folks are not using lime stabilization or lime kiln dust stabilization. Lime kiln dust is a very effective stabilization product, and it's cheap compared to, you know, hydrated lime or quick lime or cement. And uh, you have to be uh, in a position where you can store the product. You don't want to leave lay around the open. But uh, practically all the stabilization in the Midwest and uh, in the U.S. goes down with kiln dust. Yeah, 40 bucks a ton, I think, we're paying for it, something like that. Yeah. But I'm not against, by the way, yeah, geotech's out. Yeah. I've got, I got friends in that industry, too. We've done a lot of work. <laughs> We have so Errol Tudor has done quite a bit of work uh, at Illinois on the geotextiles. It's it's an effective procedure. Okay, hay otra pregunta acá en el lateral. Saludo. Eh, acto 93 está definitivamente bien definido. La importancia de la subrasante es eh, obvia. Pero pasemos al método mecanicista empirista. Una de las de las partes fundamentales es la caracterización de los materiales. Eh, existe un procedimiento, alguna estandarización, eh, algún mecanismo que uno pueda implementar aquí en República Dominicana? Esa es mi duda. From the standpoint of, you know, the characterization of uh, the various materials, I think there are uh, procedures right now that allow us to do that, uh, particularly in the area of modulus estimates and things of that sort. However, however, uh, fatigue algorithms for cracking and the fatigue endurance limit are both uh, difficult issues to establish. Like I indicated earlier, if you have uh, a desire to do this thing, we need to have informed people making the decision. It gets to be a policy call. There was a fellow called Jim Brown that used to be chairman of the Ashto Joint Task Force on Payment. He was uh, the uh, project monitor of one of our studies on uh, me calibrated mechanistic empirical design called NCHRP 1-76. And he had this thing, he said, look, you know, we build this stuff with dozers and odds and ends. You know, the rock's in the ground somewhere. The asphalt's in the ground somewhere. And you want me to predict the performance of this pavement for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And he said, uh, I'm not optimistic that that can be done. We can get better at it. Uh, but uh, you know, the concept of a hot mix asphalt surface layer that meets the fatigue endurance limit requirements, I think is a fantastic concept. It was uh, <coughs> early on, I remember when this concept popped up at a uh, National Asphalt Pavement Association Working Group meeting, and uh, the fellow that was in charge of that project said, well, we decided to call it a perpetual pavement. I said, oh, that's an interesting term. <laughs> but uh, I in reality, I if we get it thick enough and we characterize the materials properly and our traffic doesn't, you know, increase load-wise to something well beyond what we anticipate, we, we can make a hot mix asphalt pavement last a long while simply by restoring. Typically, we're getting, what, block cracking, things of that sort in the surface and a little ruddy, oxidation, you know, get it, that sort of thing. So if you mill it, mill an inch and a half, you know, whatever, replace it with an SMA or a high tight hot mix asphalt, you just keep going. You do it overnight. The folks where you up the next morning, you get good press. They say, wow, you know, the DOT just totally replaced the pavement in front of the Sheraton Park Santo Domingo or something like that. You know, it, it's a, I think, a very good story. And you can get to a fatigue endurance limit level with a, a reasonable thickness of hot mix asphalt. Yeah. So it's not uh, extraordinarily expensive to build a perpetual pavement. For high tight pavements, it's a good buy, I think. Creo que hay otra pregunta allá atrás, sí. Saludos. Y mi pregunta es parecida a la de, del señor de ahorita, pero es con respecto al uso de geoceldas o geomallas para refuerzo de pavimento y o de subrasante. 
¿Qué, ¿Cuál es su opinión sobre eso? Uh, on GeoCell, I don't have much experience. I know they have been used. Uh, the thing with GeoCell, you know, if you're if you're dealing with a situation where you're having to bring material in, i.e., you're putting a GeoCell down in your back belt of a space hand or something like that, that gets very expensive. Uh, but uh, I, I think GeoCells have got some potential. They're not widely used, I don't believe, in a lot of typical construction in the states. Typically, everybody's doing, you know, undercut and backfill with aggregate material or stabilization of, of lifts and that sort of thing. I mean, you can stabilize a lift in place very cheaply, relatively speaking. So, uh, but, you know, uh, I'm not against geo cells, by the way. You know, I, I follow the literature, uh, but uh, I'm uh, not a personal uh, fan of that <laughs> process. <laughs> ¿Alguna otra pregunta, comentario? Acá. Hay una pregunta en este lateral. Good evening. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, following, following up that question, um, looks like we still have some blind spots uh, for the EMI design. So what's your recommendation uh, for practical purposes should we still be using uh, Ashto 93? And I asked the question because me as an independent consultant, I can do the design using Ashto 93, but then if I go to the ME design, I'm going to have to hire Epsalabco. So uh, <laughs> it's going to cost me. <laughs> I, I perceive this is a what we would call loaded question. <laughs> However, <laughs> I am here to tell you, I am here to tell you that I have a colleague that sh shares with me the honor of uh, trashing out uh, structural number concepts and 93 guide concepts for flexible pavements in Illinois. The project that uh, Fra uh, Manuel did his thesis on, okay, that project started out with the express uh, bottom line of improving the technique for establishing coefficients for the materials to be used in structural number concepts. The only thing we found work was if you look at this mechanistically and uh, develop fudge factors based on mechanistic empirical analysis, you can make it work. But then we said, hey, let's just do mechanistic empirical design and, uh, you know, not do structural number. Look. Hot mix asphalt. If you're talking sections of say five, six, seven inches, every extra inch of hot mix will double your fatigue life in a general sense. Okay? What do you get for feedback for the coefficient as a function of thickness in a structural number thing? It's 0.44 for whether it's three inches, four inches, five inches, six inches, or 18 inches, and that's wrong. Okay. So no, I. Uh, Look, I, I appreciate structural number stuff. I, I was at the road test. I, I've looked at the road test data. We had analyzed a large amount of road test data <coughs> in a project uh, we had with uh, NCHRP, NCHRP 1-26. And uh, <coughs> you can unravel the road test data quite adequately based on mechanistic empirical principles, you know, design concepts, good material characterization. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of structural number stuff. Okay, how's that? Have I made have I made myself abundantly clear? Yes, sir. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> but but hey, you know whatever you know. You, I think that in some cases, uh, you know, uh, you would uh, benefit from taking your structural number design and uh, analyzing them with a mechanistic empirical approach to see whether it's realistic or not, okay? Uh, I think that would help. I, I, Franco told me he does that occasionally, so, uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it allows you to develop an improved perspective of what's going on in pavement design. Every inch of hot mix is not the same as the inch before. The same thing's true underground your basement. 
Excelente. Uh, hay otra, ya creo que la última pregunta acá en la sala, por favor. Professor, this is not to men, this is not meant to be a sales pitch, since we in the company currently have the flexion equipment, like uh, the fast FWD that you noticed on, on one of the slides. Uh, but my question is regarding how beneficial is for us in a developing country as the one we currently live in, since in one of the slides you mentioned that among the threshold values for flexible pavements, among the structural ones, the most important was the flexions. So what benefit for contractors, for consultant companies here in, in Dominican Republic would be to say, give the proper value to this type of equipment? What benefit in long term will it, will it have? I think the, the benefit of uh, checking uh, construction as you move up through the section, you can identify those areas where you've got spatial needs. Maybe you've uh, omitted a spot where you had a, a soft grade or things of that sort. But, but you know, the, the, the idea of the class one, class two, class three, class four foundations at various levels of support for the pavement, I think that's a very valid scheme. Keep in mind, though, that the modulus values you calculate, after you finish the pavement, the value you got at the time you tested directly on the lift may not be the same as the ones you back calculate because the stress states have changed. Keep in mind the subgrade soils, the cohesive fine grain soil, the stress softening, higher stresses, lower stiffness, lower modulus, granular materials. You build a heavy duty pavement over a granular layer and it not going to show a lot of uh, modulus improvement. In fact, it you know decreases as the thickness of the pavement on the top side changes. So, but uh, the idea of using it as a QCQA approach, I think, is very valid, very helpful. Yeah. Bueno, señor decano. Sí, yo tengo una petición, una eh, última pregunta, y esta es para Don Manuel, eh, y es acerca de cuáles cuáles cree él que las otras iniciativas que, que se pueden desprender de estas charlas magistrales eh, por esta la, esta lacto y Green Tech, eh, ¿qué otras cosas tenemos en, en, en espera? Bueno, eh, no hemos discutido con el señor rector en específico, pero eh, originalmente esta fue una invitación, un acuerdo de colaboración estratégico abierto eh, y, e iniciamos con la parte correspondiente a cátedras de excelencia que hoy eh, tan excelentemente, eh, si puede hacer decir la palabra y de una forma magnífica, eh, lo ha dado el doctor Marshall Thompson con su la ingeniería de pavimentos flexibles y semirrígidas. Hay otras cátedras que vendrán, una, una de ellas es la de Ingeniería Geotécnica, eh, que va a ser, eh, va a ser pronunciada eh, por el doctor Gabriel Fernández. No tenemos todavía un, una específico, eh, una fecha, pero ya él está indicado, está interesado eh, eh, y dice que es un honor eh, eh, venir después que el doctor Marshall Thompson ha dado esa entrevista. Y también con una tercera, viene que ya está así, está ya definitivamente indicada, está confirmada, eh, va a ser en la primera quincena de noviembre, posiblemente en la segunda, eh, el día 8 al 10 de, de, de noviembre, va a venir el doctor, eh, eh, va a ser de ingeniería sísmica, de estructuras, y va a ser el doctor eh, Moy, Jack May, se escribe M-O-I-H-L-E, eh, Jack May. Eh, él es también egresado de la Universidad de Illinois de Urbana-Champaign. ¿Por qué será? 
Y así tenemos otros, eh, son básicamente cinco que hemos querido. Eh, hay, hay una persona que todavía no la hemos ubicado, pero eh, es de ingeniería de, de transporte aéreo, específicamente en aeropuertos, eh, pero no sabemos que es Norman Ashford. Él estuvo aquí con nosotros, en la, en, hizo el master plan del de, de, de aeropuerto de Punta Cana y queríamos, queremos traerlo, pero... Eh, Todavía no nos no ha contestado. Y por otra parte, eh, quería indicar de que nosotros sí tenemos eh, lo que se llama un fondo que se llama Educación Continua y Avance Tecnológico. Y ese fondo de, de Educación Continua y Avance Tecnológico que es por un porcentaje de los ingresos, no de los beneficios, sino de todos los ingresos, es eh, para cada uno de nuestros colaboradores hacer maestrías o hacer eh, posgrados, etcétera. Eh, pero también nosotros queremos ver, buscar la forma de cómo en ese fondo, pues se hace una manera de eh, buscar alguna beca para algún estudiante eh, de acá. Eh, y también eh, tenemos eh, planeado el de eh, darle oportunidad a todos aquellos que antes de que se vayan a graduar, de que puedan ir a nuestras oficinas eh, a hacer el periodo de, de lo que eh, sería un, eh, previo de unos tres, tres a cuatro meses, creo que son legalmente, ¿cuántos son? Son tres o cuatro meses. Con la pasantía es de tres meses, eh, de forma tal de que ellos puedan, eh, en, en función de lo que ellos quieran eh, ir en su especialidad, porque tenemos eh, varias, eh, varias especialidades, eh, y eso le puede abrir más las puertas a a ellos e indicarse y seguir en qué piensan entonces especializarse. Básicamente estas son las otras, a medida que pueda avanzar el tiempo y a medida que eh, se desarrollen mejor los acontecimientos de los trabajos, pues, pero hay esperanza y la esperanza siempre es positiva. Bueno, muchas gracias con las palabras del, del doctor Gómez. Cerramos esta primera Conferencia de excelencia, muchísimas gracias por los enriquecedores comentarios, por sus preguntas también y en especial al profesor Marshall Thompson por su brillante exposición. Gracias también al doctor Manuel Gómez Achécar, presidente de EPSA LAPCO, al doctor Rolando Guzmán, rector de nuestra universidad, al doctor Franco Gómez Ramírez, director técnico de EPSA LAPCO y al ingeniero Arturo del Villar, decano del área de ingenierías de ITEC por acompañarnos y responder a las inquietudes. Y agradecemos, por supuesto, la presencia de cada uno y cada una de ustedes. Esta conferencia sobre ingeniería de pavimentos a cargo del profesor Thompson da inicio al ciclo de cátedras de excelencia. Nuestra próxima cita, como ya dijo el doctor Gómez, es en el mes de noviembre, cuando ofreceremos la charla Ingeniería de Estructura Sísmica a cargo del también profesor de la Universidad de Berkeley, Jack Mailey. Con esta actividad celebramos 30 años de EPSA LAPCO y la alianza con INTEC para colaborar conjuntamente, incentivando y facilitando acciones de carácter educativo y científico orientadas a promover el continuo mejoramiento de la calidad de vida de nuestra sociedad y del desarrollo de nuestro país. Muchísimas gracias a todos y todos y pasen feliz resto de la noche.